Welcome to In the House. I'm Mark Shiver, back with another member of the House Republican Caucus, Representative Jeff McNeely, District 84, Iredell County. He's the House Majority Deputy Whip. That's a lot to get out in one breath, but I did it. <laughs> Representative McNeely, welcome. Hey, well, thank you. One, one of about four, but yes, I, I am one of the Majority Deputy Whips. So uh, good to talk to you, Mark. Thank you for letting me do this. Well, uh, we're doing it on a Saturday. It's April Fool's Day, so I don't want you to hit me with no no crazy stuff now. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about running for governor or lieutenant governor like everybody else in North Carolina is at this moment. I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> that, that is April Fool's right there. There you, there go. you go. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, you're a uh, member of the Freedom Caucus, the secretary yes, of the Freedom sir. Caucus, and um, one of the things that I think was important to – that group, the Freedom Caucus, is the uh, override of Senate Bill 41, which happened last week. Uh, kind yes, of an sir. historic uh, occasion because uh, for several years now, the legislature has not been able to override anything that, uh, that Governor Cooper vetoed. And so um, that was a, a gun bill. And when you say mm -hmm. gun bill, everybody on the left wants to yeah. lose their mind. But this was not you know, like making fully automatic weapons legal and, you know, for 12 year olds, this was a, a pragmatic bill. And I thought, common it, sense. yeah, common common sense. Sense. and so uh, I, I thought it was a, a good bill personally. And I'm sure you did too. Well, I did, uh, you know, and, and it never ceases to amaze me. The, the uh, rhetoric that comes from the, the liberal side about how horrible this is going to be really, uh, we didn't really change a whole lot. We just fixed some loopholes and corrected some issues that we gave other people, namely sheriffs, a chance to correct herself, and they chose not to. And after being sued to change their ways, and they basically thumbed the court's decision after they lost their lawsuits, they left us no choice but to do legislation, in my opinion, Mark. No. And, and the part of the part of the bill that really resonated with me was the uh, part about allowing churches that have schools on their ground to be able to uh, have their safety teams or the parishioners, whoever, to be able to carry uh, on Sunday or when church is going on and no other school activities are going on. So if they choose to protect themselves in these turbulent times, they can without breaking the law. And, and I've ran that bill now. This is my third time. So I guess it's true. The third time is the charm <laughs> and uh, took a took a veto override to do it. And I appreciate the, uh, the the three Democrats that came with us and rolled with us on that. And I know it, it's been really hard for them. And I'm sorry for all the threats, the death threats and uh, this vile language, everything you can think of for them just voting for really what I consider to be some common sense bills that didn't change background checks that didn't really endanger students. If anything, it made us a safer North Carolina, in my opinion, but yet they have just been uh, villainized to the utmost. And, and I'm sorry for that for them. I appreciate what they did. They made a great sacrifice for our state to help join us and to be able to bring some common sense, second constitution, uh, rights to our people yeah yeah you know uh talking about uh, uh i was going to a, a church for a long time that was meeting in a school and mm. um now if i were still going to that church the safety team and, and by the way isn't it a shame we have to have a safety team at church Anyway, it's, it's very sad. It's, uh, the, the Lord talked, spoke about this a lot in the Bible. We we're in those days. But so it is sad. Now they can, they feel like they need to. They can, they can carry legally. Legally, legally. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, but you know, somebody might need that protection and be thankful for it if they did need it. So I, for one, think that was a, as you called it, a common sense uh, part of that legislation. So. Yeah. Um, so and, um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say in the pistol purchase permit, uh, we talked with uh, 
a lot of the sheriffs, I even tried to do a compromise to where they could still have it, but they didn't want to do the compromise. Uh, so they really left us no choice. Roughly six sheriffs that are really not abiding by the pistol purchase permit uh, law and doing it like they should made it hard for the other 94 in our state. But those six set over approximately 40% of the population. And they were, in effect, doing their own gun control, which was totally unconstitutional. But yet that's what they were doing. So there's consequences for actions. Unfortunately, some some always some of the good have to suffer along with the bad. And I'm sorry for that. But North Carolina is a better place because of this, in my opinion. People can protect themselves and their loved ones. Um, Changing the subject to another big uh, thing that's happened of late in our state. Legislature for years and years uh, said no to expanding Medicaid. And lo and behold, uh, the House uh, and Senate agreed to do that. And Governor Cooper has signed that legislation. You, however, you, however, were one of the folks that said, no, I'm still not, I'm still not ready to, to vote yes. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on why you were not ready to support expanding Medicaid. Well, Mark, I'll tell you, this is a very unusual bill for me. Uh, I was, I still think it's the largest government expansion in the history of the state of North Carolina for money being spent because we don't actually know the number that it's going to cost us. We don't. We don't know how many people are going to qualify. And so there's a lot of if, ands, and buts in it. Uh, and so I had a lot of apprehension uh, I do know inflation has hit the medical uh, field, the cost with any kind of procedures or hospital or whatever. So I, I feel for the people. And I had actually voted yes on the second reading. And the main reason, I, I, like I said, was allowed to, being one of them, maybe I shouldn't tell this, this gives away a secret, but being a majority deputy whip, I kind of get an idea what the vote total is in our caucus on a lot of different bills. And so I saw that it was going to pass out of caucus. There was enough support. And I asked if I could run an amendment. I've learned these days, maybe I don't like some of these bills, but I can either take a stand or I can figure out a way to help my constituents and or make the bill better enough to make it swallowable. And so I was allowed to run an amendment for $50 million to be spread across the whole state. Every county was going to at least get 100000 or more. It was based on population. And it would go to help with the administering of Medicaid expansion. Uh, basically, if there was any cost as far as hiring more people, DHHS in your county, and all these different things, and nurses and your health department and whatever. Right. You know, there's there's some untold, unknown cost that the counties have to absorb when we make laws. And so this would help cover them. And it also go whenever you incarcerate somebody in your local county jail, all of a sudden you become the keeper of their health. And so mm-hmm. if something's wrong with them, you flip the bill and it's a fee pay service type deal. And so you don't know what you just got into. Uh, we had a guy that was arrested with stage four pancreatic cancer. That was a little over a million dollars when I was the county commissioner. Uh, So they swore he was sitting at the lake in a nice house playing Xbox with the alarm going off, waiting for him to show up. We don't know if he did it on purpose or what, as far as trying to get help for his pancreatic cancer. But anyway, so it would also go to cover those costs for incarcerated people because of COVID. We were behind already on our caseload. Now we're really behind because the court shut down. So we have a lot of people sitting in county jails that should be in central prison or another prison facility, not on the county. So they let me run that amendment and it passed. And so I had skin in the game. So I voted for it on second reading. When I say second reading, I voted for it when it went over to the Senate. When it come back uh, from the conference committee report to vote on it, the Senate had yanked that part out. Ah. And the deal the deal kind of was that I'd vote for it if I got this amendment. And so when the amendment didn't come back over with the conference report from the Senate, there was no longer a deal. So I went back to believing that this is going to be a huge expansion. 
So I voted no. So I voted yes to send it over and no when it came back. And I guess I'm maybe too much of a man of principle. I just <laughs> I just want what I want, and the deal's a deal. And the deal wasn't kept, so I can't keep my end of the bargain either. So that's what makes it unusual. I see the need uh, for it, but yet it's such a huge risk we're taking to not be able to know. I, you tell me something's going to cost $20 million, I can budget for that. When you tell me you don't know what it's going to cost, how do you make tax uh, policy or how do you even do appropriation policy? How, how do you do this? Because you're basically got a checkbook there and you have no idea how much money you got in it. You know, you don't have no how much money is going to go out of. That's scary if you're a government. I don't work that way. Yeah. You know, you're the first person. I've been saying this <laughs> for several years now. You're the first person that has said what I've been saying, and that is, there's all these ancillary costs, and we just don't know. And I've told people that, and they kind of, oh, well, you know, whatever. But I'm telling you, when you're a doctor and you've already got a full caseload, and all of a sudden now you've got 75 more people in, that, that are knocking on your door, you're going to have to hire nurses and people that can process these claims and the whole nine. So, yeah. I, it, 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 you know, the, the the cheapest thing they always say is building the building. It's the maintenance is what eats you alive. Same yeah. principle with this thing. Cheapest thing we'll probably do is the initial cost of passing it. It's, it's keeping the thing alive from here on to whenever. That's where we don't know the cost and we don't know how much. It, it's it's To me, it's very unsettling as a lawmaker to know I've, I've actually took on an unknown expenditure for the state of North Carolina and can't tell somebody exactly what it's going to be or how it's going to be. So that bothers me. And, and so, like I said, I, I was willing to make a deal, but I'm not willing to give away the whole, the whole farm. I'm just not. Well, uh, talking with uh, Representative Jeff McNeely here on In the House, and uh, Representative McNeely wanted to ask you about a bill that you've got out there that would put In God We Trust above the, the dais in the House. I yep. think that's a good idea. I like it. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Arkansas or one of those county uh, states has done something similar uh, on their legislature. Actually, I think it's three. I think three states. Excuse me. I think three states have actually done it. I think uh, Kansas has done it. Uh, Arkansas has either done it or doing it. And I want to say Mississippi has done yeah. it. So I, I so, think. There's not a thing in the world wrong with that, in my opinion. So uh, are you getting any uh, uh, good response? Are you getting pushback? Where's the, what's um, the status of that bill? Maybe a little bit of both. I think everybody likes the idea. I don't see a whole lot of people really, you know, hollering and screaming, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. So uh, it's going to be one of these things. It might happen this session. It might happen in the short session. It might be the next long session. But it's out there, and so we believe in it. We believe strongly in it. And uh, so we're going to keep pushing till we see if we can't get it done. Yeah. Well, I hope you do. <laughs> well, I, I hope the Lord gives us the help to get it done. It, it's all, it's in, all, in him I trust. <laughs> it's on our money, so it may as well right. be uh, in our uh, house of representatives. So uh, you've got a bill dealing with him that I don't believe you've filed yet. But uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, I'm really excited about that too, Mark. I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, that bill, uh, it, we hope to get it filed Monday. We're, we're trying to work on definitions. Definitions seem to always be the biggest pain in the butt <laughs> on most of these bills we run because it's got to be defined just right. So we had one set of definitions. and Now that wasn't exactly how it is because, you know, the problem is you got state and federal regulations going here. So you got to adhere to both and try to find that sweet spot. But this is actually going to uh, regulate the uh, the hemp CBD, uh, uh, Delta 8, Delta 10, all those products that are out there that are considered legal uh, because they're under 0.3 uh, and people are using them. But there's no, it's just a wild, wild west. We have no kind of guarantees of quality. We have no guarantees that they are 0.3 or less. Uh, there's no regulations at all. So the bill I'm running is going to, I wanted it to be more of a proactive where we go out and sample product, but the Department of Agriculture 
did not want to do it, so they didn't have the, the people power to do it. We talked about giving them money. They just didn't seem real interested, and mm-hmm. I get it. So um, so actually, uh, we're going to kind of do it in reverse. I guess instead of trying to guide people, we're going to scare the crap out of them because <laughs> I got ALE to participate with me. Uh-uh. And so ALE is going to go about doing this in a way where we're going to check more to make sure these products are not marijuana. Right. Um, and, and the three big things we want out of it, or I do, there's going to be a minimum age now, 21, where you can buy any of these products. So right now, 12-year-old kid can go in and buy the CBD gummies. Uh, and, and I have a problem with that because we're not, huh. we're not regulating it enough to make sure that it isn't more than 0.3. And we continue to find products regularly that are over 0.3 because nobody has really much quality control uh, put in place. A lot of products are coming from out of the country, too. We're seeing a lot come from China, which worries me to death with the fentanyl issues that are going on. So uh, we're, we're trying to be more proactive and, and, and get out there. Also, child-proof packaging with uh, lot codes on it. So that way we can trace these lots of, that are made. We need to pull them off the shelf. We can pull all of them off the shelf, not just the ones in that particular store, if it tests high. Uh, and, and the other thing too is, is there's a licensing program in it. And the licensing program is where we'll kind of be able to uh, force people, we hope maybe to be better manufacturers, distributors, uh, of their product and to check them more regularly and make sure they are in compliance because uh, even if you get charged with a felony of over 0.3, it has to work its way through the court system. It has to go through a DA that we hope would prosecute. There's a lot of things that have to happen. This here is an automatic suspension of your license. Oh, so wow. we're going to have a licensing program. So it's kind of like your ABC permit. Very similar to that. Okay. So if you if you get caught, ALE comes back. We're going to suspend the license right off the get go while we're waiting to get through the court system and figure everything out. Wow. So and it's a three strike rule where it'll be a certain amount of days for your first offense, and it's in a three year period. It'll be so much for your second offense, and then third offense is going to be pretty severe. You'll actually your products will be taken off the market for a year. Wow. You won't be able to have a license to to manufacture, distribute in the state of North Carolina. Retail will also have to purchase a license. Very nominal. Really, the fees are very nominal. It's more about maintaining the license and doing what you're supposed to. Uh, retail, they only have to worry about making sure they check IDs and sell twenty one and uh, I mean twenty one and over. But the manufacturer, distributors, they're the ones that are going to have to make sure that their products are are quality. And we're, we've got warnings on them as far as the pregnancies, look a lot like cigarette packs as far as that, what's going to have to require. So uh, it's going to be a different world. And we think the so far, the, the people we've talked to that are reputable in the CBD hemp industry, they're loving it. They want it. The huh. ones that are not reputable, they're not happy. Yeah. And so we're going we're gonna to separate the sheep from the goats. <laughs> if you want to keep getting biblical. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. Well, uh, I always uh, seem to run long on these things, but I enjoy so much these conversations. But I do want to ask you uh, one final question. Um, I've been down there a while, and every session to me seems like it takes on its own uh, personality. This one uh, I would describe as being one of the fastest sessions that I've ever participated in. You guys are just wide slam open. I mean, just getting it done. And it's not normally like that. I mean, here it is April 1st. The budget's already out from the House and will probably be voted on next week, I would imagine. Yeah. And so that's very unusual. Do you, uh, first of all, two questions. Do you like the pace? And number two, uh, any thoughts about the budget you'd like to share? I know that's a lot to talk about, but yeah, I'm, I'm, we got another hour. I'm just <laughs> uh, I, the, the pace I'm not used to from the past uh, sessions that I've been up here in. Uh, uh, so it, it it makes me feel like I'm a little bit behind. I don't like that feeling to a point, but I get a lot of crap done when I feel like that. So it, yeah. you know, it's 
it surprises you. You put me, you know, I always say if it wasn't for the 11th hour, nothing would get done, you know. And, and so I feel like we've been in the 11th hour mode for about the last month or more. Yeah. And bill writing, not to say nothing bad, because those people work really hard down in bill writing and they've been really good to me. But I, bill writing seems to be kicking stuff out a little bit slower, which makes it even more uh, tedious. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, th this is what they chose. Uh, you know, I always say if they just tell me these things back in December, I'll be a, I'll be a little bit better prepared. I thought I was ahead of the game when we yeah. swore in. I had two or three things in Bill Wright, and I was feeling pretty good about everything. <laughs> and now it's like that gum. But you know, what we don't get done this time, I always say we get done the next. So you know, it's this is a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. As far as the budget goes, uh, we're doing a lot of help with salaries. And we understand a lot of people with this inflation persisting. Uh, it's not been easy, and it won't be easy. It doesn't look like, especially as long as the administration we have uh, in Washington, D.C. stays there because there's a problem with their economic uh, uh, intuition into this. You cannot raise the interest rates without cutting spending to affect inflation. You can't just raise interest rates. That yeah. will not do it. You've got to do both, and they have failed to quit spending. So all we've done is made life harder on people through credit cards, through uh, home loans, car loans, anything that, that's not fixed. And if it is fixed, you're, you're biting off a big chunk of the apple. So uh, I'm glad we are doing the things with salaries, but that's money we maybe could have spent elsewhere if it wasn't for the inflation. Because, unfortunately, the money we're going to give our employees really isn't going to give them that much more buying power, mm -hmm. uh, sadly. But at least they got something. Yeah. And it's a pretty big it's a pretty big number when you look at it. So it's not that we're not doing. Yeah. It's just because of the Biden administration, there's no, there's no worth to it. Yeah. That's the tough part in this. But we are trying to help, and we do understand. So uh, maybe if inflation gets under control with a lot better uh, administration in there, uh, their money will still stay the same. Eventually, they will feel the benefit of these raises. Yeah. But, um, you know, spending a lot of money still on infrastructure in this state, which I think is very wise, um, a lot of good policy in it. Um, quite a few amendments were run the other day, wasn't too many taken. Uh, so the budget's kind of what it is going over to the Senate. It will come back. Uh, we will hopefully get a chance to add in a little bit of our own spices and flavors, each representative, uh, to see if we can help get some things maybe in our district. You know, you got the big number. Now, how can I claw something out of that big number for water and sewer or transportation yeah. or whatever? Uh, so that's my job now is to try to figure out how to do that best I can for Iredell County. And uh, we had, we were, I felt like we were very successful. I call it the Iredell team or Team Iredell. Last time, that would be me, uh, Gray Mills, uh, Mitchell Setzer, and then our Senator, Vicki Sawyer. We uh, got quite a bit appropriated to us, and we're very, very grateful for that. And maybe, hopefully, we can do something in that way again of that same size. So we'll, well good. see. Well, uh, I'll have to have you back on, uh, Representative Neely, when your hemp bill uh, is moving through, and we'll talk about that some more. And uh, you're just a great conversationalist. So I could I could sit here and talk to you all afternoon, but I know uh, you've got things you've got to do. So I will say thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we appreciate you being our guest here on In the House. Well, Mark, I appreciate you having me, and I'd love to be back on again sometime. You know, I'm never usually short of anything to talk about or say. So uh, I, we can carry on a whole lot of these if you want. We can make right. this a regular. We can make this a regular weekly thing, like my radio show. <laughs> there you go. Well, we might do that. Thank you, sir.